Today, we are hosting Pedro Nilsson Fernandez, who is uh, a lecturer at the Department of Spanish, Portuguese, and Latin American Studies at uh, the University of College Cork in Ireland. In Ireland. And um, I have to say, I visited Pedro uh, before this crazy situation started. And um, his department is one of the trendiest places I have ever been in terms of academia. I had great fun. Um, so, you know, if he invites you, just go. It's a fantastic place to be. Um, but also the digital humanities research that they are carrying out is truly amazing. So Pedro is a literary scholar um, as his background, and he has done uh, fantastic research in the spatial humanities, looking at the relationships between uh, the work of uh, Manuel de Pedrolo, um, who is one of the most renowned uh, Catalan authors of the 20th century, um, and the national spatial imagination, particularly that um, in, in opposition to the Franco's dictatorship. Um, so to me, it's really interesting because Pedro's work um, has highlighted in different ways the role of the space in the construction of national identity, which is a really fascinating topic. And so today, Pedro will tell us more about this um, and also the constitution of the new Capital and Digital Humanities Association. So really looking forward to hear about that as well, Pedro. So back to you. So thank you very much, Patti. Uh, first of all, thank you for organizing this uh, amazing series of, uh, of talks uh, to keep us busy during these uh, extremely difficult uh, times. And um, I would like to begin just uh, saying um, and saying thank you also, also to, the, to the previous speakers who are fantastic as well. And I would like just to begin saying more or less the, the structure of what I'm, I'm going to, to try and, and uh, present today a little bit. And this will be basically talking a little bit about my PhD project, which is, as, as Patti introduced already, mapping the works of Manuel de Pedrolo. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the current research ideas that I have of the of things that I'm that I'm planning to do in the future very briefly. And uh, to end up, to finish up, I'm I'm going to just say a few words and a few comments and ask you for, for, for feedback uh, about the association, uh, Asociación de Humanitas Digitales uh, Catalanes, which is a an association that we just established uh, last week, and I look forward to just um, see uh, hear what you what you have to say and the and in this this digital humanities community. I'm sure uh, you'll be able to help me quite a lot in this in this uh, moment. So uh, to begin with, uh, Manuel de Pedrolo, uh, polygraph author Manuel de Pedrolo, uh, stands as one of the most prolific Catalan writers in the 20th century. He's a figure unquestionably associated with Catalan identity and the region's struggle for self-determination. And most importantly, his corpus comprises over 120 titles, uh, comprising poetry, drama, short stories, novels, as well as a number of non-fiction uh, works. My thesis uh, is an attempt to uh, systematically measure his impact through a diachronic mapping of his legacy in which I addressed a representative selection of 13 short stories and 21 novels written by the author between 1938 and 1976 in the genres of science fiction, fantasy, uh, a full chapter on crime fiction as well, and realism. And all of that from a spatial, a spatial point of view. Uh, through a painstaking charting of the spaces represented by the author in these texts, uh, I map Pedrolo's contribution to the reconstruction of the 20th century uh, Catalan literary landscape and visual, visualize the scope uh, of his overarching, uh, overarching literary project. In order to aid in the deciphering of such a wide and heterogeneous corpus as that of Pedrolo, my study combines a critical approach that draws on a cultural studies toolkit, uh, cultural geography, urban studies, uh, postcolonial approaches, with also distant readings provided by the use of GIS and a text mining script uh, called Benaura.pi, a Python script specifically designed for this project. Before I go into detail about the, the methodology uh, and give some examples of the research outputs of, of the project, I hope you don't mind me reflecting a little bit in spatial terms about our current lockdown. It is, uh, I believe, interesting to uh, to think in spatial terms in these strange times uh, that we are currently living, um, a time in which private or domestic spaces 
uh, have become the only spaces we are allowed to inhabit. In turn, we are, all, we are also seeing a dramatic increase in the level of control exerted towards our, our use of public space by our governments, with more presence of police in our streets than we are accustomed to in most uh, places, and with the threat of digital surveillance floating like a phantom uh, over our heads as Apple and Google, as you can see there, and I repeat, Apple and Google get together to help us fight this pandemic. And in a way, uh, I see it as if uh, I'm connecting to the talks that we were looking at uh, the other day. It's as if Sauron and, and the buddies in Harry Potter basically offer their help. Okay, you, I don't think we can, I don't know how you feel about this, but I don't think we can trust uh, these people. Like, I, I talk about this because uh, it also has um, a positive side, at least uh, in my case, uh, because not every not everything is a bad. Um, not everything is as bad, particularly if you're a huge fan of post-apocalyptic imagery, and I am one. Okay, my master thesis was on *The Last Man* by Mary Shelley, and this pandemic has brought some images that until now we could only see in zombie movies: empty cities uh, ready to be taken uh, back by nature. And being from Barcelona, okay, I'll, I'll post the the actual video later because I think it's better to see the video, but I didn't want to mess with the connection right now. So I'll only show you some uh, some stills. Okay. It's uh, being from Barcelona uh, as I am. Uh, it's so appealing to watch uh, this video, these stills, as it shows this magnificent city in a way that we had rarely seen it before. There is something I believe fascinating about seeing a city from the sky in this manner, as it resembles, in my opinion, at least the way we should see it in a map. Okay. If you see Las Ramblas, for instance, the very empty spaces of Barcelona, or of a city that is normally, this is Plaza Catalonia, which is normally packed. Okay. Um, in traditional maps, we don't draw ourselves in, in the maps, okay? We don't put traffic, we don't put, there's no sign of, of there's no sign uh, of us at all. And this aerial view uh, brings me to one specific point that I made uh, in my thesis. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I enjoyed the most uh, in my thesis was attempting to establish relationships between traditional spatial theories and digital humanities approaches to space. We all know masters in this area, such as Franco Moretti, that, who have paved the, the way for most of us to be able to read space as text or map text as space. But uh, I want to go a bit earlier in time and look at one of the works on space that fascinated me the most, uh, and that is uh, Michel de Certeau, uh, The Practice of Everyday Life. There is one specific fragment in the book that I will share with you in a second, but just to give you the context, uh, Certeau, when he writes or when he narrates that bit, uh, he's on the very top of a nowadays not existent building in Manhattan, the World Trade Center. And this is basically what he uh, says, okay, I am not going to read the text, but I let you a little bit of time to read. Probably you are, uh, those of you who like uh, spatial humanities will be familiar with that, with that text. But uh, just in case, I'll give you a little bit of time to read it because this, frag this fragment, in my opinion, captures uh, the tensions between close and distant reading through a very thoughtful use of both mythology and personal experience. And it encapsulates the essence of the hybrid mapping methodology employed in my thesis. On the one hand, we read about uh, Certo's privileged position at the summit of what once was one of the tallest buildings in the world, from which the city is, and I quote, transformed into a text that lies before one's eyes, and quote again, allows one to read it. This view uh, may, may be seen as analogous to the distant reading approaches in literary geography, perhaps best represented by uh, the, the work that I talked uh, well before by Moretti, for instance, Atlas of the European Novel. But on the other hand, when Certeau talks about experiencing the city from within, entangling, and I quote, streets that turn and return it according to an anonymous law, and define it as a mass that carries off and mixes up in itself any identity of authors or spectators, or when he highlights uh, its labyrinthic um, nature, he ultimately does so to emphasize the complexities of the city seen from this other perspective. As he is in no longer at the privileged summit of a, of a skyscraper, 
he as a reader or viewer is confronted with the individuality and heterogeneity of uh, urban spaces and its inhabitants. A multiplicity of identities creating, enacting, transforming and belonging to such spaces when you are low. If, uh, if Sertos' view from the summit of the World Trade Center could find a methodological counterpart in the distant ready, Moretti advocated for his for in his 1999 book, uh, this other view of the city from ground level requires a completely different approach, uh, a nuanced reading that is able to capture and reflect on every particularity of the city and, and its interaction. And I would like to draw on, on this use of, my, of mythology, in particular his mention of the solar eye and the, fi and the figure of Icarus, in, in order to defend uh, the use of a geographical uh, information systems approach as, as a distant uh, reading tool within my methodology. Because if you think about it, however well located Certo is on top of that uh, building, uh, that is a single view that he that he has. Uh, in the same way, Moretti's, uh, Moretti's figures in that uh, prior book are can only represent one frame and one uh, location at a time. Icarus view from the sky, however, with the with the absolute freedom of movement uh, his wings provide, promises the best possible perspective. So does GIS, allowing dynamic, customizable and multi-layer views of uh, data represented in a given uh, geographical area. Thus, the, the incorporation of GIS in literary studies, and I quote Patti uh, Murrieta et al. here, driven both by a growing interest in the study of space, place and landscape, and by the refinement of the application of quantitative methods and computational approaches in literary research, end of quote, allows the researcher to produce infinite visualizations of data extracted from literary works in a way that static maps fail to do so. In the same text, later on, uh, Certo talks about uh, an, an, Icarian, uh, an Icarian fall as, um, as a negative term, as, uh, as falling down from that uh, from that uh, view, and being entangled again in the city and in all those imperf imperfected uh, approaches or, or angles to 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 observe the city. But what if we see the effective use of GIS as a text map reading tool, not as an Icarian fall, but as a successful Icarian flight in which we avoid getting too close to the sun, so the walks in the wings does not melt. That would be the a situation of a GIS map so zoom out that the interpretation of data is no longer possible, but also avoiding to getting so close to the water that uh, the feathers uh, in the winds do not clog, which is the other extreme, like being too close in a GIS visualization uh, or visualization, where it's too close and we don't have any any perspective. Okay. So avoiding these two extremes and putting GIS at the service of and in connection to close readings of the text, and I quote uh, Jessop here when insisting on the fact that, uh, begin quotes, stati statistics still have a role to play, but interpretive skills are the scholar's primary tools. End of quote. We align here with uh, Sartor's distinction between a scopic and a gnostic drive, in which the former perspective, the former uh, perspective totalizes and distances the special object of study construction and illusory unified view of such spaces, while the latter seeks uh, out hidden avenues of knowledge and intersections of individual stories, myths and memories assigned to such spaces. Alison Murray uh, defends the same uh, hybrid approach uh, when he points out that, and I quote, digital collections are not only data sets to be mined for quantitative quantitative analysis and display, but also demand traditional close readings of the text that digitization has made accessible in abundance. Thus, this uh, Iker Icarian fall, uh, Certo describes as a fall back into dark, the dark space where crowds move back and forth, crowds that through visible from on high are themselves unable to see down below, must not be seen, as ne must not be seen in negative terms only as a sudden loss of the privileged perspective of a solar eye, but instead of necessary step in any, any blended methodology, attempted to connect and make the most of distant and close readings of literary spaces. So I would like to uh, stop a bit with the theory and, um, and, uh, and begin showing you a, a few examples on how I use that, uh, this type of theory, this type of blended approach in my, in my thesis. The first example that I want to show you uh, is about 
a short story that is called uh, Transformación de la Ciudad, which is Transformation of the City in English, written in 1947. And uh, to tell you about the plot very, very quickly, it uh, begins with, um, with, um, with a person who is uh, in uh, it's a character that's called Artur uh, de Form, which is uh, in, um, in a mental institution and he meets with this fantastic character who uh, has that magic power that if given a piece of paper, he can draw a map and what he can basically do is by drawing things uh, in a map in different locations as uh, the ones that are uh, normally located, he moves things in reality. So it's kind of a, a fantasy or magic uh, world. And uh, there's, a, there's a moment, it's a very short uh, story, but during the night that Artur and, and, and that narrator uh, go to Barcelona, these powerful instruments of social control that such a city represents in, 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 Foucault, uh, in Foucault's idea of, of, uh, of a control in architecture, is no longer in the hands of the established order, but in the control of two deviant individuals uh, instead. They do not only transform the city by redrawing its, its architecture and overturning the repressive and authoritarian nature of its structure, but they also unveil the significance of the places they relocate. Okay? And this is very significant because the, the specific sites that Arthur, that Arthur chooses to dislocate are places of memory. Okay? Those places that you can see in the map now, they're not random spaces. Okay. When you name them and when you do a close reading of them, uh, you discover that those places have, have had, during the Francoist years, a very particular um, significance. The first location is Plaza Urquinaona, for instance, where Arthur manages to superimpose the city's slaughter, slaughterhouse. This now fam famous square was the location of one of the infamous Falangist, which is the far-right uh, party uh, in Spain during the dictatorship, interrogation centers during, during the, at that time specifically at the Credit uh, Lyon's building and the Banca Tusquets basement. The next transposition that he makes um, happens only a couple of blocks away, as Pedrolo chooses La Cruilla del Caer, uh, del Carre Casp, in order to transform it into the Cementiri de San. So he transforms another site of memory into a cemetery. And uh, another of the, of the locations is basically uh, between Bruch and Girona streets, uh, what was uh, what happened there was that one of the deadliest missiles dropped by the Francoist Air Force in 1938 fell exactly in that in that corner. That is one of the the examples uh, in uh, in the case of uh, of fantasy and and science fiction. The other uh, example that I wanted to show you very quickly is uh, that idea uh, of of the change through time or of the or, or the chronotope as um, as Patty's um, project that she shared with us uh, last week uh, shows very, very nicely yes, with uh, the use of, of the chronotope of, the, of that change of space through time. And in this uh, particular case, I wanted to show you uh, these two novels, okay, uh, which are basically the first uh, crime fiction novel by Manuel de Pedrolo written in 1953. It's based on a fa fossil that you see in yellow in the map and the last novel that he writes in red, Algo que no había de ser. The, the particular thing that these two novels uh, have or that they share is that they're uh, almost identical in, um, in, uh, in plot and in structure in kind of characters. They, all, they, they both depict a haste, just a robbery, a bank robbery. But uh, the first representation in 19, uh, that he writes in 1953 uh, shows uh, many places uh, that are uh, more related to periphery to the periphery. If you have a look at the map, the yellow spaces they show a lot of, uh, with the exception of many locations in Barcelona and Girona, which would be the bigger, uh, a bigger, a relatively bigger city. The other points uh, in the map are more uh, rural and they basically represent the uh, social structure at the time when uh, at the beginning of the dictatorship there was still some, um, some presence of the, of rural activities and, and, and um, and uh, less industrialization. Whereas in the second, in the second view, you can see <coughs> that uh, there's more concentration of urban spaces, and that is something that to get like that, uh, having a look first at uh, a close readings of those novels, and then and, and then at uh, 
combining the the approach with uh, GIS reading, I could I could just have a look at the difference of uh, of places that were that were shown. Another thing that is also kind of very um, very particular from this um, from these representations is that. Uh, if you have a look at all the crime fiction novels and how they are located in here, you have like you have five uh, five different um, novels located in Barcelona city center. So so many in Barcelona, there is a, a kind of a fl um, fluidity of peripheral and central spaces, and this is one of the many instances that exemplifies uh, how spaces in the Catalan context, uh, as in any other, I suppose, in any other big city, only offer absolute classifications within the urban rural. Uh, dichotomy when very superficial traits of their geography are taken into account. When different layers representing the social, economic, political and historical, uh, historical complexities of the area are added to the map, uh, 20th century Catalonia, much as in the present day, does not contain an urban space that can strictly be defined as by its centrality, neither are rural ones uh, entirely peripheral. When the appropriate level of uh, uh, depth it's applied to the spatial analysis of Pedro Los narratives. The fluidity of concepts such as central and peripheral is highlighted, removing any absolute definition of centrality or periphery. What is more, notions of economic centrality often ascribed to cities such as Barcelona are rarely defended by the representations of Pedro Los test. On the contrary, when economic wealth appears in his narrative, it is used to highlight the enormous gap between idealized conceptions of the city as a place for opportunity and dreams of prosperity and the character's realization of the oppressive nature of such space. A good example here is that in, in one of the novels, there's a criminal gang that, that actually has uh, their, um, their place to gather or their, their place to hide in one of the, uh, one of the most expensive uh, areas in Barcelona, in most of the high class. Uh, areas in Barcelona, and that is, I believe, a move by uh, by Pedro Lo to just try and break that uh, that uh, that binary between uh, that uh, dichotomy between central and peripheral very very clearly. Then another of the things that uh, that 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 I could just have a look at straight away with uh, Jay's is the case of Inspector Rivatar, which is the inspector arrives late. Uh, and it's uh, another crime fiction novel by Pedro Lo that uh, in opposition to the other novels that you see that have many different uh, representations that can be uh, toponyms that can be identified in a map. This particular one, uh, even though it happens in the city, it happens in a city that we believe to be, uh, that we know to be Barcelona, there are only three, uh, three points uh, that can be uh, deciphered or that can be identified. And looking at those spaces, like it's very strange because the, it is a very similar uh, type, of, type of novel, but uh, it is pretty clear that the author here is uh, doing it on purpose and just anonymizing the rest of the, of the, um, of the toponyms or of the locations. So we have a look at those three specific points. And these three specific points have a lot of, I'm not going to go into detail at the moment, but one of them is, uh, is Carrera Ali Bey. Ali Bey was a, was a very famous, um, a famous political um, figure that, uh, that had uh, a big role in, um, in the, <clears throat> that had a big role in the actual uh, past of, um, of, uh, of Catalan, Conquest, like in, in in the in the Catalan or on the on the war for independence in Catalonia, so it is it is actually. I think I'm sorry about this. I think my connection is. I'm gonna remove the camera because my connection is not great at the moment. But um, sorry about that. The other, the other two points are also of, uh, of quite importance because one is uh, Arc de Triomphe, which uh, is full of statues and representations of a, of a, um, of a bigger historical uh, event. And then um, the, the, the fact that um, Pedrolo situates only those three points uh, as has or, 
or motivate me to just have a look at what those points uh, meant for the history of, of Catalonia. Another thing that I that I wanted to uh, have a look at and that I managed to to incorporate was the let me see the playing a little bit with the with the different layers of uh, GIS and incorporating um, layers incorporating layers in um, in GIS that came from a reading that was previously uh, done in a traditional way. With this, I refer to this particular novel, Mechanoscript del Second Origin, in which I use the color coding, uh, the color coding here in the points of the of the novel, just to add um, a different layer that indicated gender and sexuality in this uh, trip. I'm not going to go very much into detail about the about the story, but just to give you an idea, uh, this is a 1974 science fiction novel that became the most sold Catalan novel in the years of transition to democracy in Catalonia, partly because it came at a time in which schools needed a key work to motivate students to read in Catalan again, because it had because Catalan teaching of Catalan had been banned for the past uh, 40 years at that time. Uh, just to tell you that it's a post-apocalyptic novel in which two, two teenagers, a white Catalan girl and a black second-generation Catalan boy, are the only survivors of an alien attack that eradicates life on Earth. And they go on a journey around Catalonia and through the Mediterranean, which is what you can see in the map, in search for survivors. My reading of the novel dealt with uh, notions of cultural reconstruction, as I saw reasons to believe that the writer was anticipating the end of the dictatorship and the need to start over again, free from the horrors of the past. Besides, a look at the gender perspective in this novel, as the traditional reading, readings of the novel looked at it as if, as if as feminist teenager uh, bestseller, in which Alba, the female character, uh, teaches Didac, the young male character, how to survive and be strong. The brave female character may have been a feminist icon in the Catalonia of 1974, but having looked at most of the corpus of Manuel de Pedrolo and his depiction of women that was often problematic, uh, often over-sexualized and relegated to objectified roles, I perform a gender reading of the note that was more adequate to the current times. What GIS allowed me to do was to modify a simple layer showing the locations featured in the novel, which go through the Mediterranean coast and back to Catalonia, as you can see, and add the gender element to the visualization. I color coding the locations according to the female's character sexuality. I could visualize the author descriptions of her body and her status throughout the narrative. As this novel is very much about the voyage in search of survivors, a common trope in last man narratives, mapping the strip is pretty much mapping the entire plot of the novel. Against the supposed feminist tone that early critics had claimed permitted this novel, a spatial and narrative analysis of the novel shows that Alba's roles are virgin and mother, of Didac, of the, of the kid, in the first in instance that we see in green, as the difference in age makes the female character have to adapt to this role. Then we have uh, sexually, sexually active uh, for the smallest amount of time reflected in the map, just a few locations that you can see in pink, four locations to be exact. And then she becomes pregnant, as we see in purple, to later give birth and become a mother again, orange at the very end, back in Barcelona. For a novel that has been described by traditional criticism as a chant to female sexual liberation, it turns out that this GIS visualization allows us to quantify in spatial terms uh, how much the narrative allows for such liberation. <clears throat> just uh, this was the, the, the last example, just to talk a little bit about the methodology, but very, very quickly. Uh, the methodology that we basically used was uh, we created a Python, like with Python, a, a very small script, like a do, do I, why, in a way, script, in which we uh, we had a CSV that acted as a gazetteer that was uh, that we could change uh, at will, and the base was on geonames, so I took all the all the all the data in 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 geonames that was. Uh, particularly referred to, to, to the area of Catalonia. But I also needed to include uh, 20th century name places. For instance, I indicate here Franciscalia, which was a cultural, um, a cultural uh, center at the time that 
at the moment, if you Google it, I believe it, it turns, uh, it shows us a nightclub in Barcelona that is completely unrelated to the act, to the original place. So I had, so I had to make that choice also because of the scope of the project, like the low scale of the project allowed me to just make decisions such as, such as that to, to just have a look at, at how, um, how to adapt it to Catalan. Also, an, a different thing was the, the particular ways in which the writer referred to a street, to give you an example. If you think about, for instance, uh, Avinguda Diagonal, which is uh, one of the main streets in, in Barcelona, uh, it would only show in the map uh, if you had the GeoNames database, it would only show in the map if it was specifically Avinguda Diagonal. If you had instances, for instance, as Diagonal or La Diagonal, uh, you would lose that point of information. So the way the, the script uh, worked was basically you inputted a, a text, a text of the a literary text, and that, um, and that script compared uh, the CSV file that we had inputted before as a gazetteer, and then it gave you an additional CSV file with uh, the name of the locations and the, the frequency of those locations. And those CSV files are the ones that I input straight away to that tool that you saw there, Kepler GL, which is just as simple as inputting it. Uh, there is an online tool that was uh, easy enough for me to use and, and produce those specializations that you see there. Uh, the CSV files and the JSON files for each novel are available at that address on my at Pedrology AS. So the CSV files are basically individual by the novels that I used. And uh, and then the Pedrolo GIS uh, bit is basically a, a collection of CSV and JSON files, and JSON files is basically uh, maps that I that I actually customize, that I choose the colors for them, that I probably include like ten novels at once to just see the evolution of time. So if you have, if you want to have a quick look at, at them, it'll, it'll, they're available for for you to have a look there. So that was the first part. Uh, of the talk. The second was basically, uh, I would like just to tell you a little bit of what I'm doing at the moment. The last thing that I've been doing was uh, just playing a little bit with um, with uh, stylometry and with author sheet of attribution because there's one uh, anonymous uh, erotic novel written uh, in the 80s that people say that belongs to Pedrolo, to the same writer, but it has never been proved. And what I'm doing at the moment is writing an article trying to prove or to, or to disprove this theory. The future plans that I have is just uh, forget Pedrolo for a while because I've been dealing with Pedrolo for quite some time and uh, have a look at uh, something that fascinates me that it's, uh, there's a book uh, called After the Civil War by Richards uh, that, um, that uh, looks or creates or coins that, uh, that the, the term cultural trauma, but in relation to the civil war in Spain. And what I'm trying to do, like he, he works with some texts in order to formulate that, that uh, cultural trauma, um, that cultural trauma definition. And what I want to try and do is see if through topic modeling and using a corpus, and using that, the, those uh, texts that he works with as corpus, if I can actually detect a, a pattern in, in, if I can actually find cultural trauma with digital tools in some texts. And if that works, what I want to try and do is, because those texts are normally political uh, texts written at the time and written mostly by men, what I want to try and do is uh, extrapolate those, th that analysis uh, to the 20th century female uh, Catalan writers. And, uh, and see how that transformation from genres uh, work. And finally, okay, uh, and if you have any comment about that or, or comments about that, it will be lovely to have a look. Uh, the, um, the final thing that I wanted to talk to you about very quickly is just the Associ Asociación Humanitas Digitales Catalanas, which is an association that we've recently created <coughs> that was born uh, during lockdown, but in construction since 2015, and promotes digital scholarship across the arts and humanities within the field of Catalan studies. It works to preserve and reconstruct the Catalan digital record through convergent practices that build synergies between cultural heritage centers, maker communities, academic and governmental institutions. While the main role of the 
um, of the association is not to theorize and or to inform Catalan scholars about what the field of digital humanities is. Publications such as, such as uh, debates in the digital humanities already do that. We are committed to make available the self-declared inclusivity of the digital humanities as, as a field in order to give visibility to Catalan culture on the digital sphere. Then this association strives to overcome what we believe to be the consequence of uh, Catalan language and culture's double position of subalternity. Uh, with double referring to first being a non-English language culture, an obstacle shared by many cultures seeking for a digital presence, and two, the addition of Spanish language hegemony in most of the territories where Catalan is spoken. In this regard, we foster synergies with other associations, centers and scholars working on digital humanities projects that have minoritized cultures other than Catalan as the focus of study. So uh, to give you some examples, just in one week, we had 181 subscriptions uh, to the mail list. And you have to take into account that this is, uh, this is only about scholars that work in Catalan. Um, in Catalan um, uh, projects, over 30 projects proposals because we are we are establishing just a, a network of projects and a network of, uh, of contacts. And uh, you can visit our website there and follow us on Twitter as well if you want. But one of the issues that we are encountering, uh, and if we go back to the to the bit where we said that the role of the association is not to theorize or inform or educate Catalan scholarship on what DH is, we encountered the first issue because uh, we have to do something about it in a in a way. Like a great example, I believe, is uh, it's um, a scholar that I admire greatly, Isabel Galina, and her closing keynote in DH uh, 2013. And uh, it is interesting because she she begins the the talk by saying that by talking about uh, an immigration officer asking her what was her purpose of traveling from Mexico to Nebraska. And she was saying, I'm going to a conference. Uh, what is the conference about? It's a digital humanities conference. And here comes the question, what is digital humanities? And she basically replied, how much time do you have? Because I have to catch this, this flight in a way. Um, as one of the roles of the association is promoting existing DH research in the Catalan context, one of the things that we're currently doing is mapping that research and inviting scholars to submit existing projects they have produced or are working on. And the experience has been quite interesting so far, but not an easy one, to be honest. First, uh, we're just beginning as an association, and the last thing we want to be doing is to create an image of ourselves that says we are the Catalan DH overlords and your project will never be the H and for us or something similar, you know. But at the same time, when we have scholars submitting a YouTube video of their latest conference talk as a DH project, as necessary as that digital presence is, uh, we need to politely draw a line and define whether we want or not what digital humanities uh, is, um, is for us in a way. And what I have here, um, like that is, that is all uh, for me, but I have some figures here to show you. Uh, just to see the first map, and this was created very, very quickly with the with the project sub submissions. So, <clears throat> so just so you have a look, uh, we have most of the projects that we've received are databases or digital editions, and then we have a little bit of nat nat natural language processing, and small examples of the other like GIS design, DH gaming, and. Again, we're only at the beginning and it's only one week and I'm sure we will we'll, we'll have more uh, indication of, of what Catalan Digital Humanities uh, looks uh, like. But what I wanted to actually show you or ask you for is yes, feedback at this time and I'll look at your questions uh, in, a, in a second. But what I'm going to try and do, if I can, is uh, if I can, is basically do, 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 uh, show you that the link and copy it in the chat, maybe because it's a little questionnaire, just so you see the type of question that we get, the type of project that we get submitted, and uh, the that that response that we should give, like why is this digital humanities? Is this not digital humanities? Why yes and why not? So just as a little exercise, if you want to just uh, give a hand later, I'll I'll share that in the in the chat, but that will be all from me. And thank you very much uh, for your uh, attention. And let me see uh, the questions. 
That's fantastic, Pedro. Thank you very much for that. That has been really, really interesting. And I think it's also really thought provoking because um, we have been for a while, I think, um, people tend to think that digital humanities is kind of a, a new field, but in reality it's not. It has yeah. more than 40 years already. So, yeah. and, and, and the idea that we keep on defining what digital humanities is, mm -hmm. is actually quite interesting. I think there are parts of it that are really well defined, but you know, it is in the nature of technology, I think, as well to change. And so as these, you know, as long as technology is changing, digital humanities keeps on changing and will keep on changing. So that's a really interesting question. And so, um, yeah, so just to uh, let you catch your breath a, a bit, but I was also wondering, I mean, just regarding the first question and particularly because uh, the association is just recently formed, I think it will be um, a fantastic idea, uh, you know, to give it a thought to join uh, organizations like Daria. I mean, we have here Sally Chambers, uh, who is, you know, a great part of that. Um, and so it will be great if you talk to her um, and see whether you will be interested in that. Yeah, we, um, you know, but, but as, I, as I was saying, like, we are very, uh, very, very early stages. So so I think we, like, and, I, and we are very, very sure uh, that, that that's the way to go but other organizations that we have uh, colleagues at, for instance, like the Asociación de Humanidades uh, Digitales Hispánicas, uh, they had a long, and I, I know some of the, the people who started the whole thing, and they had a long uh, um, a long road before they before they actually went and, uh, and asked for, for support from Daria, but obviously we will be uh, the first the first contact that we will make, make will, will definitely be with, the, uh, with you guys. But bit by bit, because we're we're still uh, starting or launching this this project in a way. So, can you see the questions, Petra? Yeah. I'm just uh, scrolling through there. Scroll. Do, do, do. Question like this okay <laughs> that wasn't a question uh the second comment if not it will be great yeah 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 perfect thank you yeah zoom has a um, made me laugh as well the topic for control is mm -hmm. Oof. that's not an easy question there huh patty so uh the topic of the control space Yeah, the experience of place like to be honest with you uh, i would just go uh, more uh, for um for a sentiment analysis uh, look at it in a way like visualizing it it's pretty pretty difficult in a way, but it but it'll be it'll be very interesting to just have a look at those spaces and do a collocation um a collocation exercise and uh, and have a look at the terms that go together with space and see if those spaces are associated with trauma or associated with memory, which is, and I suppose that in a way, even if we visualize them there, it will, it will always be very difficult to, uh, to visualize the context and, and then that nature of, uh, of spaces um, permitted with, um, with memory or with pain without, without a textual background in a way. I don't know if I answered to your yes, question. Yes, absolutely. I think I think it's a really difficult question. I think there is a reason why we are kind of like increasingly turning to mm -hmm. um, to other ways, right? So uh, basically to uh, gaming engines, for instance, or things that bring us a bit closer to all our senses and into the use of all our senses, including you know vision, smell, and so on. Um, I think there is that reason why deep mapping started to emerge. But yeah, that's, um, yeah, so collocation, yeah, I think that is one of the ways that we can definitely try to do that. Thank you for that, uh, for that question. Um, thank you for this as well, I believe. And uh, how do memory maps in all their various forms link in with a close reading approach through textual GIS? Ooh. Good questions here. Um, an example that I know I I know it's not it's a combination between between close and 
between close reading and um, and distant reading, I suppose. Uh, what I al what I also did uh, besides mapping uh, the novels that I was just looking for uh, to analyze, I also did a different exercise, which was uh, mapping uh, academic books that talked about uh, memory and 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 space in uh, in the Catalan context or in the Spanish context, and that actually gave me quite a quite a few uh, toponyms or places that in a way they were already uh, associated or charged with that with that idea of memory or, or, or with that idea of conflict or, or historical uh, events that had that had basically uh, helped shape that uh, that uh, cultural trauma for instance that we that I was mentioning before so uh, in a way if you like I did some exercises in in, uh, in using different layers, a layer that came from a from a book, and toponyms from a book uh, that was academic and was just defining places or talking about places of memory, and a layer of uh, of places in a in a novel, and there were uh, there were some there were some places that that immediately um, immediately show a co shown a coincidence and. In a way that helps, that is another way of GIS enhancing uh, the the traditional uh, met methods that we use for research as well. So it's not only using GIS to to enhance uh, digital scholarship, but also to just make uh, the close reading more effective in a way. Then we now have panopticons everywhere. I think that's a yes, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so it was just I was thinking because when you were talking at the beginning about Apple and uh, Google and all of this business, I went back to the Jeremy Bentham, is it kind of panopticon, which was a fixed space. Uh -huh. And I just wondered, because all this surveillance and that sort of thing, that the panopticons are no, they, they're everywhere. And I wonder if we needed to rethink this kind of theory of what a panopticon is now um, in, in this context. So that's what I was, it was a bit of a stream of consciousness when you were speaking. It is, it is, because it's just uh, that, that, uh, that story, for instance, that I mentioned at the beginning, the short story that, um, that, that plays with that idea of being able to just modify, modify spaces. And uh, that, that story in a way uh, finishes uh, with the police coming and and uh, and asking uh, the two the two people who have been moving places around in Barcelona city center, asking them to just erase that, to just go back to the status quo in a way to just. So in a way, it is it is kind of a, a representation of how of how can you, how you can defy uh, that that uh, that vigilance. And this is interesting as well because there's another uh, short story. By, by the same writer and, and around the same time, in which something as simple as a, as an individual going around his block for hours and hours creates a creates a very strange uh, feeling because it's in a way he's not he's basically using social space in a very strange way, but he is not uh, doing anything against the law in a way. And uh, this, that short story in question continues in a way in which he continues walk, like going around different blocks and a lot of people follow him. And it's just a way as well of, of showing how political organization works in a way or the use of social space in a, in a pacific, uh, in, a, on a, in a peaceful uh, manner, in a way can, can skip uh, that, that uh, vigilance or that surveillance by by the panopticon that we're so uh, so used to in a way. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, you map geogra geographic places. What about non mapable space and inside places? Mm -hmm. uh, in a way, like because like it's a very 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 good question. Like initially, the um, Initially, my my research was going to take into account those non-geographic places or, or those non uh, uh, non toponyms in a way, and I even had a chart uh, that reminded me, like when last week uh, 
we had that fantastic presentation with different uh, with different um, specifications of different types of of, of plates. I had come up with with a similar chart in a way, but looking at rural, non-rural, uh, urban, uh, non-urban, or house, or thing. But uh, at the very in the very end, like the 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 scope of the thesis did not allow to to go further in that in that way. But what I noticed quite a lot is that um, that the that for instance in that crime fiction. Seeing like the the descriptions of places uh, are probably just cri a criticism to to um, uh, to how to how society was at the time to to the poor conditions of post-war uh, Spain in a way, but there's there's a feeling of um, of being trapped in small spaces all the time. Uh, that uh, that being said, like the like it would be very interesting to to actually do a a topic modeling. Uh, analysis on those of those spaces of those uh, places or of those novels to see uh, which feelings or which uh, or which words are are associated to or associated with uh, with those spaces. But what I remember from where what I remember from crime fiction specifically and some of the realist novels as well was that there was a, a there was a lot of uh, anxiety uh, related to those to those places and all the vocabulary was about dirt about lack of space and about um about um very very limited uh freedom in a way <clears throat> that's really interesting Pedro thank you let me see That question about two stereotypical allusions to places between literary texts. Uh, in the case of Pedrolo, definitely, definitely yes. But but the thing is that, uh, as I think I try, I, I mentioned before, uh, in the specific case of 20th century Catalonia and 20th century Spain, as well, uh, there was no no. There were very very few rich areas, to be honest. So crime. The, the interesting thing looking at Pedro Lo's first novel and the last novel was that the people committing the crimes in the first novels when when the when the war just uh, finished were people who were kind of in in very isolated uh, places people that were kind of in the in the limits whereas whereas in the new uh, novels in the novels that reflect the situation of the of the 70s uh, we have that a semi working class uh, committing the exact same crimes and being in the same uh, situation of of uh, of, uh, of, of poor or or or, um, or very um, in a way very uh, don't know I can't think about the word now uh, isolated or or in very in very bad situations in a way in very bad economical situations. So what he does through through that range of time is just. Uh, Describe the evolution of uh, of the of the dictatorship years in a way. And thanks for that uh, link about the London. I'll have a look. Thanks for the comment. Can you tell us more about the possible challenges of creating gender maps? Uh, to be honest, the to be honest, I didn't I didn't create any any other. Um, any other uh, gender gender maps? I did. The, I created um, this map for this specific um, this specific crime fiction, I science fiction novel. But uh, it is just a, a, a matter, I suppose, of of uh, of doing that close reading and uh, and adding adding the layers, um, adding adding meaning to to the to the GIS map through through the layers that you. That you have already done some some uh, close reading uh, research on it, and again the the tool, I think it's fantastic because it's very very simple, straightforward to use. And if and if you are not um, planning on doing something like like a huge analysis, I think Kepler does the job very very well for for small projects uh, such as this one. The joys of gazetteers, uh, Sally. Yeah, the Franciscan, the Franciscalian, 
uh, it could it could be there could be a there could be a historical significance but the thing is that the the talking about that nightclub the thing is that the that franciscalia uh, reference uh, the catholic church in in catalonia uh, as opposed to in some of the places in spain at the time had a had a massive uh, role in 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 preserving catalan culture in a way in a, in in a way if you look for instance at one of the most important and most surviving um, magazines of in Catal of catalan culture that's serrador which is in the mountain of montserrat which is uh, a, a very it's it's a, a very important uh, catholic uh, monastery up there so uh, in a way the i don't i don't think the nightclub Will have a specific reference to to religion in that time. In that time, and even though Franciscalia, the actual the actual uh, location changed uh, a couple of times, the disco was in a in a very unrelated place. So, so I don't know exactly what the. Interesting. Now, I just wondered if you trace back through the owner of the nightclub and maybe they had, I just imagined in my head, a social network analysis of, but, but maybe I'm being a bit too suspicious here, but this I, kind of idea, if you trace that people back, there could have been a link. That was I should, why. I should, Sally, I should, because the because in the in the case of this writer, I have to say that I was suspicious about absolutely every single toponym that I found out of place. I was suspicious already because I found a lot of information that, like it, it's it was it was very rare to find a place in the novel that had put there by chance that had been put there by chance. So that's why I I really think that that by mapping the works of this uh, of this author, you in a way in a way you can reconstruct part of the of, of the Catalan. Uh, experience or culture of, of the of the 20th century in a way but yeah I'll, I'll give a call to, to the, <laughs> this thank <time>. you <laughs> are the texts of the civil war fiction or are they accounts uh, Patricia are you referring to the new project or to the old project to the new project Pedro. they are they are, they, are um, they so the ones that that are analyzing the academic academic book that I'm taking as a reference the after the civil war their most political political accounts or or political manifestos or accounts of the war and most of them are written by by political figures of the time right. and, the interest, and the interesting the interesting thing is seeing how the narrative shifts not even you don't even have to wait for for the transition to democracy to to see the change the change of the ideology like directly post-war uh, before the 60s there's a there's a, a type of narrative after the 60s when they when the dictatorship or with, with franco decides to open a little bit more internationally the the narrative changes completely and then uh, during the during the, the during the transition to democracy there's also a there's also a big a big uh, change so they are they are most of them they are they are political manifestos or political accounts or political opinion pieces in in uh, in newspapers but it's a very very interesting i'll, I'll share that uh, that work with you if you want to have a look because it's very very interesting yeah that's great thank you so for gis uh, i chose i used uh, kepler and that uh, and that um how do you call it that uh, Benaura, that that tool, which is a very small script that I can that I can send to you if you want. It's a uh, like I, I'm I'm hoping to put it in to put it in GitHub, but I want to to just uh, modify it a little bit more and add a bit more of uh, of um, of options to it because at the moment it's very it's very basic. And uh, answering the question, what made what made me choose the the actual uh, the actual tools is is, is um, in the case of Kepler, the simplicity because it is almost as as quick as just drag dragging and dragging and dropping the CSV file to the browser and you have the map straight away, and you can make modifications very easily. You can export in uh, in both CSV and, and JSON, so 
you can easily, if you want to just add more depth to that to that map or that, to that configuration of map that you've created, you can you can export it in JSON and then just go to a, a bigger software or a more powerful tool and just uh, and just change uh, your map. So it's it's ideal to to do kind of a, blend, a blended approach like the like my thesis um, consisted of like I was most of the time I was just looking for for something that could give me quick visualizations and and quick results in a way. I hope I answered uh, a question. And what does design DH cover? So uh, in a way, I am not an expert on, on digital humanities design, but I think that it has to do a lot with uh, not only pedagogy, uh, like pedagogy apply, like apply, applied to, to digital technologies and digital humanities, but but basically, uh, it's also designing um, designing the the actual delivery of of of, of the age lectures, or or is it's more about the the structures in which we can we can teach the age, or or basically being very aware of of the type of digital humanities content that we create and and the receptors of uh, on the out the audience to to that to that content, I believe. But I wouldn't be an expert in in, in digital humanities design in a way. And being at the age overlord sounds fun. It doesn't. It's not fun. It's not fun at all. It is very interesting. It's very exciting because because we're seeing a lot of excellent projects and very nice um, very nice uh, projects and, and initiatives. But it's also a bit difficult because because we're not like I am not an expert in. In everything, I I have a very very specific niche in, in which I move comfortably, and the rest is just like, oh my god, what is this? So, and it it probably happens to to a lot of us. And uh, just the just those those two links that I put there. The first one is just the video of Barcelona from the sky, which is kind of quite exciting to see. And then the other link that I put there is basically a Google Docs form with just four small projects, and because I want to. To see others, like the decisions of the, on those projects have already been made, but I but I wanted uh, to share kind of a little bit of what the experience of uh, of creating such a such as such a small project at the moment from the beginning was. Um, let me see if there are more questions. Uh, I believe that's it, uh, Pedro. Uh, but I was just going to say, well, um, before we go, Ben just left you a message there because um, our PG community at Lancaster um, is launching a fantastic magazine. And uh, Ben is the editor for digital for the digital humanities subsection. So, um, you know, he was asking whether if you have any, you know, colleague, student or yourself that want to submit an article or something like that, um, he just left um, the, the link there. And so, yeah, so thank if you, no Andrew. one else have anything else to add, um, thank you very much for attending. Just a quick reminder that next week we are going to have Imogen Webman at 12 o'clock um, in the UK, 1 p.m. Um, in European time. And so again, Thank you very much, Pedro. That was really fantastic. Thank and you. have a lovely weekend. Thank and you. we will see you soon. Very well. Thank you. Have a nice one.